Well, hey there, friends. Welcome to another exciting edition of The Link, where we live at the intersection of faith and culture, helping you to think critically and live compassionately in a rapidly changing world. Today, I'm really excited to talk about what I would consider to be one of the top areas of discipleship. You know, when we think about the local church, we think about our jobs as moms and dads, and we think about the call of Christ and the gospel to disciple uh, men and women, I often think about that first starting in the home. I think about that with my children. And if you were to ask me, what are the top areas of discipleship the church needs to think about in the future? I think of three things. One is certainly human sexuality. Everywhere we look, that's a conversation that is happening in a broader context of what does it mean to be human? Uh, what is a biblical anthropology, if you will? But the other area I, I often think about is, is woundedness. There's a lot of folks who are talking about church hurt, and we're going to have to help our kids and the next generation think through that. But the third area, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is what I would call digital discipleship. Uh, how do we disciple our hearts? How do we uh, think biblically about technology? How does technology shape our souls? You know, I often say, as a person who has been heavily involved in media, both radio and um, recordings like this, that media is never neutral. Just know that when you're watching something that or listening to something, that your soul is being shaped in some pretty uh, intense ways. Well, I, I believe that to be true about social media. I believe that to be true about digital platforms is that the way that they are used often are accompanied by a worldview. As a matter of fact, if you uh, read uh, mo most of the ethical literature on digital platforms, they're being designed with a worldview in mind. And if you know that, then as a Christian, it can help you to be able to have the right cautions and to leverage technology for the good of men and for the glory of God. So today I want to help you to think biblically about digital spaces. And I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with than Jason Thacker. Jason has been a frequent guest on my radio program, Equipped with Chris Brooks. Jason is Assistant Professor of Philosophy and ethics at Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky. And he is also the author of a couple of books that I want to feature today. One is The Age of AI. This is a great book that I would highly recommend. And secondly is Following Jesus in a Digital Age, another awesome book that Jason has written. Jason, so good to see you, man. How are you? Doing pretty well. It's good to see you too. Hey, talk about your passion for this area. Um, when we think about um, thinking biblically about digital spaces, not many people are writing on it in, in comparison to uh, other topics. What uh, caused your heart to say, no, I need to think about the intersection of faith and technology and to help people to uh, understand what it means to follow Christ in a digital age? Yeah, a lot of it came down to kind of my story, even growing up, mm. and realizing my dad was very involved in technology. He worked for a Fortune 500 tech company when I was a kid. So I was always exposed to these things very early on, having the internet, having access to these things, but then also um, having kind of a ministry background of having theological education, theological training, serving in the local church, and starting to realize that one of the ways that we are being shaped, even what you said a few minutes ago, is that we are being shaped and formed in many ways by our use of these devices, by these devices, these gadgets, these technologies. And it always reminds me of Romans 12, 2, where Paul writes, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed by the transformation, the renewal of our minds through the power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that I think in one of the primary ways we're even being shaped and formed today is by the power of technology from the device mm -hmm. that never mm -hmm. leaves our side Probably somebody's even watching this. Their cell phone is within about a foot of them at all times. We have smart watches, smart devices. We are always constantly connected. We have more information than we can ever hope to process. And the question for Christians is, how is that shaping us? How is that forming us in our perspective of God? 
our perspective of ourselves as human yeah. beings as well as our understanding of the world around us. And for me, that's why I feel like this is something we need to be thinking about and focusing on because technology isn't just a separate set of issues that we think about or talk about, but it's actually an element of all of the things we think about in terms of discipleship. It permeates every single aspect of our life, from our family to our jobs, to our churches, to our community. And I think that's one of the reasons that Christians need to think deeply about these things and think, how does the scripture inform how I am to live in light of these things? How am I to live and engage in ways that help me to love God and to love my neighbor as myself? And we're going to get into some real practical things, like how do we deal with the fear and anxiety that comes along with the rise of AI. So those of you who have been following the artificial intelligence conversation, you're definitely going to want to stay for this conversation. We're also going to talk about how we can uh, maybe even think evangelistically using digital platforms. But before we get to that, one of the things I like about you, Jason, is that you're not a Luddite. <laughs> what, it, what does that mean to be a Luddite? Yeah, it's someone who kind of withdraws or rejects technology outright. Um, interestingly enough, it's often certain types of technology, not all technology in general, because when you say the word technology, most people today think of digital technologies. Yes. But when we take a more biblical kind of holistic approach to what technology is, the shovel and the hoe and the printing press, the book itself is a form of technology. It's a tool that God has given us. He's given us the creative ability to make and to use. And it, it has good aspects, but it also has negative aspects. And so it's not all good yes. and it's not yes. all bad. But often when we see a lot of the, the advancements that are happening with technology, a lot of the, the dangers, the wisdom, the way that these tools are used and abused, a lot of folks in understandably want to withdraw and say, I'm not going to be part of any of that. And then on the flip side, though, you have people who kind of wholeheartedly embrace. It's very optimistic. It's all good. We should definitely use That's these right. innovation for innovation's sake. And again, I get that mentality. There's some good here. But from a Christian perspective, I think we don't say it's all good nor it's all bad. But as you said, it's also not very neutral. It's shaping and forming us. And so what we need to be able to cultivate is wisdom, not an outright rejection and kind of pessimism, dystopian fear of the future, nor this kind of optimism, all things are good, we should just embrace it and keep moving. We need to ask that question of should we do something rather than just can we? And I think that question is a question of wisdom and virtue that's really at the center of the Christian life. Yeah, I love that. And I want to get back to that question because the question of should, uh, ought is a really important question, not just can. Uh, but let, let's be positive for just a moment if we could. What's so good about the digital age that we live in and the platforms and tools that we have at our fingertips? I mean, we can have this conversation. I mean, the little things right. like that, I think we, we fail to realize all of the benefits, all of the conveniences, all of the good aspects of the technological, the digital age that we live in, from mass media and social media to connecting to knowing what's happening across the world and just moments. We can have breaking news. We can pray for people. We can connect with the people. We can build some level of relationship with people. We can access information. We have medical technologies, medical breakthroughs that allow us to live longer and healthier lives. We can connect. We can learn. We can grow. There's so many benefits to these tools. They make our life very convenient convenient sometimes and very efficient. And those can be good things as well. Not gods, not idols, but they can be good for us as we think through. And even thinking that God created us, he made us in his very image and we're creative beings. There are people even maybe watching this who create these tools or are involved in this industry. And I want to affirm like you're doing good godly work. Your vocation so matters. And so it's not all negative with technology, but it's not all good with it. And so I think we need to kind of take that kind of more balanced approach, say, look at all the good aspects of technology from medicine to communication to just a host of social and political issues that can be beneficial. But on the flip side, there are many dangers, and we can't get kind of siloed off into one or the other or pit these against one another, I think, within the Christian worldview. Yeah, let's let's uh, consider for just a moment the benefits just a little bit further. You know, I'm a Gen 
uh, Xer. And so that means that uh, if you think about the way uh, generations are described, I'm not a digital native, and I greet some of these things with a little bit of suspicion, don't mind being a late adapter. And so I can remember life before the internet and social media and all those things. Um, but I remember when I did first uh, get on social media, maybe the first day or two that I um, got on the social media, I got an inbox from a woman in our church who shared with me that she had not been able to come for quite some time because she had been sick and facing challenges and allowed us to minister to her in a way that probably wouldn't have happened had I not been on social media, it was her way of connecting with us. And so when I think about ministry, it really does uh, connect us globally, connect us across generations, connecting us um, in ways that maybe no other generation has ever been connected. And that is a good thing pastorally, that's a good thing relationally, but yet, I think that in 2012, when the smartphone came about, there was this promise that we were going to be able to conquer loneliness, that we were going to, through this uh, wide array of connection and connectivity, solve the problem of loneliness and isolation. But the fact of the matter is, Jason, you know and I know, that um, man, that, that problem's only multiplied. As you think about your concerns with the digital age, kind of the other side of the coin, what rises to the top for you? We can't enumerate every concern, but maybe what's your biggest? Yeah, and that's, I think that's a wise way to kind of put it is there are a lot of big false promises that were made. It's interesting though, even some of those big promises of connecting the world and having richer and deeper relationships and community or having more access to information than we could ever hope to process. In some ways, those dreams came true. We do, in many ways, have greater connections with other people, information about other people and what's happening around the world. But there's a flip side to that. And we're kind of starting to experience where a lot of people are becoming a little bit more weary of technology. We're seeing how powerful it really is. We're seeing that there's skyrocketing rates of loneliness, isolation, where people are always connected to our phones. We're, quote, connecting with people, but we're never really building relationships, especially with those who are right next to us, whether it's in the store or in the pew or in our own families across from the dinner table. We seem to be very isolated and focused on me and myself and I, what I want. It's all about my posts, my feeds, my likes, my this, my friends, my connections. It's all about me, me, me. So some of the the dangers that I see and some of the concerns that I have is that technology allows us to very much isolate and to kind of navel gaze to focus on ourselves, which is in direct kind of contradiction to what God calls us as Christians to do. I always think it's fascinating when you look at the great commandment. Think of Jesus' own words in Matthew 22. He says to love God and to love your neighbors yourself. You see that's a very outward action. It's loving God and loving others as ourself. There's an assumption you're going to love yourself, but we're actually called outside of ourselves to love him and to love our neighbors, those around us in our communities and our churches and even in our society as ourselves, to care for them, to love them, to think of their interests, to think of their needs, to bear one another's burdens together, especially as the local church. So one of the dangers and kind of concerns that I have about the technological age that we live in is that it's very isolating. It's very individualistic. Yeah. It's all about me yeah. rather than us thinking kind of more holistically, especially as the church community, to be even broader in terms of societies and cultures. So that's yes. one danger I see. But then there's also another one that in the midst of that, it's very dehumanizing. You think of a lot of the questions coming up with questions of artificial intelligence and where we're heading, and I know we're going to get to that here in a little bit as well. But you think of like AI, it's very interesting. A lot of the questions that are coming down are that same question we're asking in light of um, big kind of cultural issues in terms of sexuality issues and marriage even. is that question of what does it mean to be human? In a digital age, there's a unique answer to that. It's often based on what we do rather than who we are. And that sense of how we are humanizing in some sense or having questions of machines and what they may become one day and all of these ideas, we're humanizing this. At the same time, we see we're nothing but just a 
collection of matter. We're nothing unique. There's nothing special about us. We're not really um, in the image of God per se. We're just uh, materialistic beings, for example. And so there's this yeah. kind of dehumanizing nature to technology as well that kind of alters not only this kind of inward look, but then also seeing ourselves as nothing unique, nothing special, nothing set apart, which the scriptures are very clear that we're created in the very image of God. We're unique and distinct because of how he's made us and uniquely made us in the rest of creation. So those are some of the concerns that I have as we think through a lot of the dehumanizing, but also the very isolating nature of technology today. Yeah, that's so good. And, you know, I would add just one more, and that is in an information saturated age, uh, I think we are confusing information for wisdom. Yes. And you've referred to wisdom several times in this conversation, and there is a huge difference. And as I think about discipling my kids, I want my kids to be wise. I don't want them just to be smart. I don't want them just to have information or even just intelligence, um, which is a part of it. I, don't get me wrong. Uh, but if they have information without the wisdom on how to live skillfully, to apply those things, what good is it? And so as we're raising our kids, let's think about wisdom with them. I've been studying with my 13-year-old son through the book of Proverbs. And uh, we're just slowly going through it. And uh, my hope for him is that he would be wise. And this is what we need to be praying for, for our kids. And if we're in leadership in the local church, for the local church, and for those that we have been called to uh, walk with as Christ is formed in them. Let's talk about AI because, man, that is a big conversation. It feels like we are living in a sci-fi movie. I think about the rise of the robots and uh, being replaced uh, by, by robots and machines. On the one hand, uh, that's humorous and it makes us want to laugh. On the other hand, there's some reality to that. I got a chance to go and visit the largest Toyota plant in North America not too long ago in Georgetown, Kentucky, not too far from where you mm -hmm. are. And uh, of um, the, uh, the 22,000 uh, workers there, 7,000 are robots uh, that help to deliver parts, that help to repair other machines and uh, the other 15,000 are human beings. And man, it was a weird deal seeing all of this, but yet they're producing cars, I think a car every two minutes or so. So there's efficiency that drives this type of innovation, addiction to the advancement of technology, but I couldn't help but to think, what does the future hold? So how do we think properly about AI in a world that seems to pit us in increasing ways against uh, technology. Yeah, I want to pick up on one thing you just said there that is really insightful is this concept of efficiency. It's interesting with technology yeah. that technology as a whole is designed to make things efficient, convenient, faster, better, stronger. But when you compare efficiency and wisdom, wisdom is actually very different. Wisdom is actually yeah, very yeah. slow. It's something that's not obtained quickly. It's very slow and over time. Even think of the Proverbs. I'm starting to get a little older. I've got a little gray in my beard and a little bit gray in my hair. My, hair. my wife likes to point that out all the time. But it's also one of the things I kind of look forward to that. The Proverbs speak of the glory of gray hair, its experience and wisdom. Some of the wisest people we know and we look up to are actually older. And there's a value, there's almost a glory in that in the sense of they're, they're reminding us of a, a good, a well-lived life um, of experience and navigating some of those things. In many ways, wisdom is very much at odds with efficiency. So when you think of if the goal of technology is efficiency yeah. and convenience, how are yeah. we kind of flipping the script to be cultivating wisdom as we start to navigate those things. The well, and I think it goes I think it goes back to the ought question. Yeah. Not can I, but ought I do this? Is this right? Is it moral? Is it good? And if you don't remember anything else from this uh, episode of The Link, I want you to remember how important it is for us to question technology before yep. we just blindly jump into it. Yep. To ask questions like, and I'll just give you a couple, what is this doing to my soul? 
In what way is this shaping my soul? Like what virtues is this cultivating in me? I had to train my heart once I got on the Twitter that it's probably not a good thing for me to hop on Twitter as soon as my feet hit the floor in the morning because it was like cultivating anger and outrage in my heart. Mm -hmm. it, it really is a place where you go to to find out the many reasons why you should be mad at the world. And so I had to cultivate in my heart like, no, that's not great for me to do it. Now, there's times when I get my news from there and it's great for that. but. Um, I needed to ask myself the question, how is this shaping my soul? I think another great question is, um, how can I use this for the glory of God? Mm -hmm. um, I think every technology we should be asking that. But then the other is, how is this technology impacting my fellow man? How is this impacting others around me? Because again, if I reject the hyper-individualism of our age and to recognize I'm called to fulfill the first and second commandment, great commandment, and that is to love God with all of my being, but to love my neighbor as myself, then I can't just think about this on an individualistic level. I have to think about, man, how is this shaping our community? And I want to give like big kudos to those who work in technology, like you did, who are asking those questions. I remember a news report came out from the Washington Post not too long ago about Google employees who were working with the uh, U.S. Um, Department of Defense producing robots who uh, could fight, combat robots. And uh, they paused the project and said, no, if there's not an ethical uh, code of conduct around this. We don't want to just produce these robots that can be used by militaries around the world to uh, go into war. I think that if you have the privileged position of being a technology employee at a company, then you're there by God's grace. You're placed there by Christ, and you should be bringing uh, ethical, moral, and Christian questions to the conversation. Let me ask this question, uh, Jason, about evangelism. When you think about how we can leverage technology for the glory of God and the spread of the gospel, what comes to mind? What opportunities do we have? I mean, you look at the kind of the history of the Christian churches. We have long embraced technology, especially as a means to share the gospel around the world. Think of the, the great ministry of Billy Graham, the evangelist Billy Graham, and how he employed radio technology. He was pioneering cable television, pioneering TV broadcasts, pioneering magazines, newspaper, all using whatever means necessary to be able to spread the hope of the gospel, the message of salvation to as many people as possible. Even think of things like the book, being able to put the scriptures into a readable format or the printing press, being able to spread that information. There's so much good that can come of that in many ways, and it's understandable that we, especially missionaries among us, pastors, ministry leaders, but really all of us, we can use these technologies to spread the glory of God, the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world. But one thing we have to be careful of in that is the there's an old saying from Marshall McLuhan, uh, who's a philosopher and a writer and sociologist, and he said that the medium is the message. And what he yeah. means by that is that the mediums in which we use, whether it's Twitter, whether it's a book, whether it's uh, news broadcasts or whatever, it shapes the message. I mean, you think of this, especially with Twitter and X and all of this, and people think of, I think in tweets, or we think in these kind of short, pithy That's statements. Right. It's changing kind of how we think about information. Um, if you go, I was telling my students even today that uh, one of the things with books is that the older books aren't very tweetable. You can't actually take uh, like a really short kind of pithy <laughs> statement. They're often longer and complex sentences. You see even that, how digital technologies are shaping and forming us, like we spoke of earlier, and even shaping the message itself. And so that's, again, it's called that call to wisdom. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. That's the question of ethics. That's the question of discipleship. That's the question of wisdom. And even as you referenced it with your son is the book of Proverbs, even the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, remembering who he is, how he made us, and how he calls us to live in light of those truths is really at that yes. core of that wisdom tradition. So there's a lot of good, especially with missions and evangelism and spreading the good news of the gospel, but also remembering that the gospel message going forth isn't just about downloading a bunch of information to people. 
but actually seeing a transformation take place. There's an embodied nature. It's not just information, but it's actually about transformation, that holistic embodied transformation uh, that we were created for and that we need. And that's part of going there, go there for and make disciples, not just teach them a bunch of information, teach them to what to do what God has commanded us, that sense of what we believe really and what good. we do and pairing those together really is at the core of that wisdom tradition. You know, I've lived with this thought that um, technology is a great supplement, but never a substitute yep. for in-person relationships. So in as much as it can help to enhance our relationships, that's great, but never use it to replace the importance of walking together and, until Christ is formed in our hearts and uh, in those that we are called to disciple. Now, I will debate with you uh, the fact that uh, C.S. Lewis is the most tweetable Christian <laughs> the world has ever known. So we'll have to have that debate at another time. Uh, what is your hope for those who will pick up the book Following Jesus in a Digital Age or the Age of AI? What is your hope for them? That they would seek to love God and to love their neighbors or self. I mean, that's really at the core of this kind of paradigm, this kind of what do we do in light of all of the social and technological changes and shifts that can conjure a lot of fear, whether it's from AI and the way that it's shaping and forming, it's automating, it's can be dehumanizing in some ways, but also, as you said, it can be a supplement. Maybe we can use these things and to think wisely. So really coming down to say, how do we live in light of who God is and what he's done for us? In the sense of we're called as Jesus' own words to love God and to love our neighbors ourself, prioritizing the dignity and the value and worth of every single human being, whether they're Christian or not, recognizing that they are made in God's image. They're infinitely valuable and worth. Uh, they have dignity and slowing down to realize that. And so my big hope, especially with these books, with these conversations, is to say, yes, let's talk about the technology. Let's talk about how it's shaping and forming us. But to do so from a hopeful perspective, I think it's easy to conjure up uh, whether you know visions of AI robots kind of taking over society and having yeah. a lot of fear in that or fear and being very saddened or even upset or rejecting a lot of the technology before us. Both of those positions are understandable. But as Christians, we don't live for tomorrow. We live for the time, the, you know, the, the coming kingdom. Jesus, I always remind uh, when we talk about these conversations, especially with a lot of the fear of today with technology, is that we have that ultimate hope that coming hope, Jesus is alive. Jesus is sitting on the throne. That means the end of the story has been written. So while we still face significant challenges with technology, we need to think through how these things are forming and shaping us as people, as well as the world around us. We do so from a place of hope, a place of, uh, of looking forward and longing of how God has called us to live in between these times and to know that he, the end of the story has been written and that we can live in light of that and have a deep hope, an optimistic look out, but also very realistic of saying we have some real challenges before us and we need to cultivate that posture of wisdom and virtue that we've been talking about this whole time. Friends, I hope you can see why I'm such a huge uh, fan of Jason's. Uh, I think he is one of the clear cultural thinkers of our time, and his books are really important as we try to live with the hope of Christ and with uh, biblical wisdom as we think deeply about technology. Jason, if you don't mind, I'd love to pray. Father, thank you for uh, just the wisdom you've given us uh, to be able to navigate through the world in light of the gospel. Thank you for those who work in this field of technology, those who even through this conversation might sense a deep call uh, of Christ upon their lives to go into this type of work, to uh, write on these topics, to help to inform the church of how to think in light of your word. I pray that there would be um, a sense of calling for many who watch. I also pray that there would be a deep burden for us to uh, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, to be able to look at the world through the lens of the Word of God, even and in particular in the area of technology. Bless moms and dads and those who are pouring into the next generation. Help us to lead them in a way of salvation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
and amen. Well, Jason, thank you for joining me, brother. Always a joy to have you. Yeah, it's good to see you too, Chris. Friends, as I started this conversation, I thought about it as a parent. Uh, the fact of the matter is we as uh, parents, moms, and dads owe a responsibility, a debt to the next generation, grandparents as well, to be able to think about these things, even if you feel like you're so far detached from it. I encourage you to make sure that you're thinking deeply about it. But for the young adults who uh, are living every day, engaging in social media platforms, AI technologies, I want you to remember the questions that Jason encouraged us to think through. Uh, how ought we to live, uh, whether or not we should engage in uh, activities, not blindly just going the way of our culture, but pausing, and it's okay to slow down. Sometimes it's in the slowing down that we get the wisdom of Christ. But ultimately, and I love his ultimate goal, to cultivate in our hearts a richer and deeper love for God and love for one another. I believe that if we're driven by these things, we will use technology well to the glory of God and to the good of men. So I hope that this uh, program was enjoyable for you. Do me a favor, pick up the books. You can find out more in our uh, postscript in this uh, program. And I pray that you will share it with others as well. Let's use technology. For all, until all have reached, until Christ returns. God bless, and I can't wait to see you again on the next edition of The Link.